first of all, thanks everyone for having us. This is super exciting. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, we have two great panelists today uh, who are uh, uh, friends and also um, real leaders in thinking in virality. Um, Ed, I went to Stanford with, and he is uh, a real expert in virality in a number of different platforms. He's been working on viral things for the last 10 years, I guess? Yeah, the first one in 2000. Which is, a, which is a long time considering how old Ed is. So, uh, and, that, and that project has like 10 billion people using it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Ed now is CEO and founder of Friendly, uh, which is one of the biggest Connect sites on the internet for Facebook Connect. And fun fact, he's also uh, a big marathon runner. So he ran the US Marathon Olympics in 2008. Is that right? Yes. Nice. The trials. The trials. The Just the trials. Okay. 2012, you'll have the uh, actual ones. Um, and Dave is, uh, Dave McClure is a, a great guy and, and for me epitomizes a lot of what's uh, fun and exciting about Silicon Valley. He's smart. He's opinionated. He wears ironic t-shirts. He has a blog where he writes things in caps. Um, and he's worked. <laughs> <laughs> and he's worked at basically, worked or invested at like a ridiculous number of companies. So PayPal, LinkedIn, Mint. I never officially worked for LinkedIn. Didn't work, or, or but worked yeah, with did, or around. But you never got paid. So oh, you never got paid. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's, there's a huge long laundry list of... Uh, if you're listening, <laughs> um, and you're into Ultimate Frisbee, which I know because you ditched our conference call today to go play Ultimate Frisbee. <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> so um, I, I, how we're going to start off is Dave is going to give a, a breakdown of the framework of what we're talking about, and then Ed is going to run into some specific examples. Then we'll do sort of a Q&A back and forth. So uh, Dave, you want to take it away? Cool. Um, Should I transfer this over yes. from person to person? All right. Great. So, um, so really, I would just say that, you know, I'm not an expert on virality. I just play one on TV. Um, Ed really is. So I try and uh, learn a lot from startups and entrepreneurs who I think know what's going on, and I facilitate that education uh, through inviting them to speak at events that I put on. Um, but I kind of wanted to talk a little bit just about a general framework for kind of anything but really web development more specifically, and then maybe how virality fits into that. So um, I've been doing this talk in various forms for a couple of years. How many people have heard of Startup Metrics for Pirates? OK, so not everybody. Um, so basic idea is kind of how you think about you know, product or feature or marketing uh, for internet companies. And um, specifically, I guess one thing that's happened over the last five or 10 years is there's a lot of different ways that acquisition of users occurs. So primarily via search and social channels, but there's lots of other traditional PR methods um, and biz dev and even you know, television and print uh, other areas. Um, anyway, before I dive into all that, so the five step model is uh, acquisition where users come from, activation, the happy first experience they have with your product or widget or landing page. Uh, retention, they come back, uh, referral, they tell other people, and revenue, you make money, either direct or indirect. Uh, and originally that was modernization, but then I realized ARM isn't a very fun acronym to say, so I changed that to revenue, and A-A-R-R-R-R, -R -R -R, pirates, whatever. Uh, so it's kind of stupid, but it works, and Are it's... Are you going to make everyone say R? Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll get to that, we'll get to that, all right. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do the wave, too. Um, so, uh, and although that's the order of presentation, I actually try and get people to think about, um, you know, whether they're going after, you know, an activation or retention process first, which is usually around building the product, um, or this big acquisition referral product uh, process, which I think really usually happens after you've got some kind of basic product together, and Ed may have a different philosophy on that for certain Viral techniques, um, people are not as concerned always about you know, what the underlying product is, but I still think you know, even if you're going after a very quantitative approach to uh, getting users to get you other users, you still want to have you know, underlying engagement and call to action that uh, Julia was talking about, where really there's, there's a problem to be solved. Um, you have an initial engagement experience that's kind of that, that activation landing page experience, and then there's other things that kind of draw that person 
into continuing to use that product. So again, I think you know the punch the monkey example is you can be very controversial and you know garish about getting people, you know, to come to your site. But if they don't ever stick, you know, you're not going to get them to be a returning customer, and you're probably not going to get them to have a strong uh, referral option for a viral loop either. Um, so. Uh, one thing to just kind of think about is there's lots of uh, methods of user acquisition. Referral is really a special case of that where your existing users tell other users. Um, it's usually done in particularly products or businesses where um, value per customer might be low or cost of uh, customer acquisition is desired to be low. Um, so there are other businesses where the value of customer acquisition is high and you don't necessarily need to do viral models. They're helpful if you can find them, but um, case in point might be a company like Mint.com where I was an investor. The user value might be measured or estimated north of $20 or maybe even $50 a customer. Um, you can afford to spend money on other paid acquisition methods uh, that don't have to be viral in order to make that kind of a business work. On the other hand, um, you know, businesses like PayPal in the early days where the average customer value might have been single digit dollars or Facebook these days where it's probably at least currently single digit dollars, you don't have a lot of money to spend on customer acquisition. And so having a free method, ideally a user driven method, is very important. So a lot of thinking about whether to go after a viral approach or go after a paid approach or others has to do with what's the overall look of the customer acquisition cost and you know amount of people available and then what's the value that you get when you get those customers into the product. Um, so in any case I'm probably going over the five minutes but those are sort of five general ways to kind of think about how do you build features, uh, how do you acquire users, how do you get them to stick and how do you make money. Um, can we flip to the other slide? Uh, and again, this one's probably a little bit more complicated but what I like to get people to do when they think about product building is how do you think about different customer types and different conversion actions and can you ideally get that onto one page, right? So I, I like to say that this is kind of a one page business model where you can get the basic customer types and the basic customer lifecycle actions onto one page for everyone to kind of look at and then start, and it doesn't have to be three rows or columns, but to start to think about which of those actions or which of those customer segments are high value start to prioritize those and then really engineer features to drive kind of those actions. So those boxes are sort of sound like features but they're really trying to target what do you want customers to do as they engage with the product over the life cycle and then how do you how do you come up with creatively the features that drive those users to take action uh, and then build that in. So a lot of the third column around this distributor component uh, is mainly you know satisfying that person that you want to be a viral spreader of the concept and so what types of actions in this case the example is a slide share or a slide sharing site um, the people who create media on user generated content sites might not always be the people who are spreading the idea and the people who consume or view it may not always be that person either so you may have this third class of customer that's neither creating nor consuming but is doing a lot of that you know viral spreading of the idea and there may be psychological or monetary incentives that drive them to take those actions so those are two ways to maybe think about you know how you're doing development uh, and product and marketing I take the. Uh, yeah, sorry. So, as Matt said, I've been working on viral viral growth as applying that to the consumer internet for the past ten years. With my first website back when I was in college, um, it was actually cool. So. Uh, I'll get to these in just a second, but I'll, I'll quickly mention the first website I built, which was in 2000. Uh, that was datesite.com. What you see up here is like the next version of Datesite that was mobile-based. Um, it was a very simple application where you'd put in email addresses of people you had a crush on. They'd get an email saying someone has a crush on you. Go to datesite.com to see who it is. And then um, those people would go to datesite.com, put in email addresses of people they had a crush on, and that the product was inherently viral because you could only find out if you got a match if you put in email addresses of your crushes. Um, so anyone who would get that message, this was back in 2000 when people were actually highly likely to click on links they got in emails. 
<laughs> versus today where those emails don't even get delivered because they get caught in spam filters. So it actually worked back then in 2000. Um, this uh, date site up here, 2006, I actually built pretty much the exact same product but using SMS instead of email. Um, so this was back uh, in my first year at the GSB when I launched um, datesite.com for SMS-based. Um, we grew to about 50,000 registered users and we were using one cell phone with an un unlimited text plan. Um, and that was the reason we kind of couldn't grow anymore was I, I didn't want to have to pay for text messages. Um, it was viral, but um, you know, I, I figured the carriers probably wouldn't like it either at the end of the day. So that was more of a fun project. We proved it could get viral, but um, the summer after that first year of business school, I was trying to decide what to do, thinking, should I continue to work on DateSite, or Facebook had just opened up their platform that summer. So instead, I decided to work um, on the Facebook platform. Uh, and that's when I worked on an application called Compare People. Um, so we were one of the first applications uh, to launch on the Facebook platform. Uh, that one grew to over 10 million users in four months. Um, I'm no longer directly involved with it, but it, it actually has a lot more installs than that right now. Um, and that was actually notification-driven virality. Um, some of you may be aware that Facebook is getting rid of notifications 30 days from today, actually. Um, but that's one of the many channels you can use on Facebook these days to get viral. Um, Send Hotness was the next um, Facebook app I worked on. And I actually worked on that in a class at Stanford that was, um, you're not, you weren't officially considered a professor, but you taught the class. Heaven, heaven forbid. So I don't know what, what your exact title is, but that's where I first met Dave, um, was in that Facebook class. And that's also where I met my co-founder, Joe Keem, who was an undergrad at Stanford at the time. Uh, and we teamed up with um, one other uh, engineer named Alex and built Send Hotness. And that one grew to 5 million installs in five weeks. Um, and that was a um, invite-driven viral loop. So compare people was notification-driven. Send Hotness was invite-driven. Um, I think as Julio was mentioning before, back in 2007 and 2008, uh, Slide and Rocky and a lot of other uh, companies were able to build these viral apps using invites and requests on Facebook. That's another viral channel that has kind of died recently. It's because of them. Largely because of them and because of me. <laughs> so, um, but then uh, more recently, um, back in August of 2009, we launched Friendly, which is the current project I'm working on. It's actually a Facebook Connect site. And um, that's grown pretty quickly. I, I initially had numbers on that slide, but then my co-founder looked over yesterday when I was putting together this slide and he's like, don't share numbers. <laughs> so I had to delete them, but um, it's gotten bigger than any of the other three so far. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. Um, so this is my last slide. Basically, I wanted to show an example of how I think about the viral loop. And this particular example applies to Send Hotness, which was the um, the third one I, I showed you on that prior slide. Um, but the same methodology and framework works for pretty much any viral product you're building, regardless of what platform you're on or what channel you're using. And um, the basic idea is, and this was mentioned before already, but I'll just uh, reiterate that um, for every new user who joins your site, you need them to generate more than one new user. Um, in the case of Send Hotness, our viral factor was 1.4. So that meant for every new user who joined, they generated 1.4 new users, who then generated 1.4 squared new users, and so on. Um, and so with, it's very sensitive around that number of 1.0. So if you're under 1.0, you don't see anything. And if you're above 1.0, like at 1.4, we grew to 5 million users in five weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very sensitive uh, threshold. Um, and the basic idea here is x times y times z is your viral factor. In this case, um, invitation rate is the average number of invites that get sent out per user. Conversion rate is what percentage of those people that receive invites actually click on them. 
um, and install the app. And then Y would be the, I'm calling it the engagement rate, but that's actually probably not a very good word for it. But it's basically the percentage of users who install the app who actually send out invites themselves. So this is just one way to think about that framework. And it obviously depends on what your product is. It might not look exactly like this with the three steps. But at the end of the day, it kind of has to feed back into itself. So let me no, give this you back to that on, so okay. we'll have it in the middle of us. All right. Should I like hold it out or it's so okay on. like this? Is, uh, um, so uh, guys, you talked about for both your frameworks, I think um, you uh, talked about the importance of data and metrics. Can you talk a little bit about A-B split testing, how important that is on each part of that, and perhaps some uh, unintuitive things you guys have discovered from doing A-B split testing? Sure. You want me to take that? Or? Please. OK. So um, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, so if you look at this slide, for example, the conversion rate x is, well, each of these numbers is really important, and you want to maximize each one. So when we first launched, um, our conversion rate X was probably like 10% um, and our viral factor was below one. So we actually had to come up with, test out a bunch of different invite messages to see what message is most likely to get a number higher than 10%. And ahead of time, we can kind of like use our intuition to try to think, oh, if it says this, they're more likely to click than if it says this. But at the end of the day, you don't really know until you test it out. So the way we do that is we come up with 10 different possible invite messages, and we just test that across our users. So one-tenth of them see this message, one-tenth see this message, and so on. And then we look at which, if we send out 100 of each of those messages, which one gets the most clicks. So that's just a simple example of how split testing works. Um, just one other quick example back with to date site. When we first launched date site, we were finding that when someone would get a crush message and come to our site, they would, on average, just type in one email address or one phone number. And that was not nearly enough to get the thing viral. So we found that by making a small tweak where we said, OK, for every two email addresses you enter or every two phone numbers you enter, we'll give you a hint about who likes you, suddenly the number of email <laughs> addresses that were entered <laughs> went up sixfold. So our viral factor went from like 0.2 to 1.2. Do you, do you find that image also has an impact as well as the copy editing? Definitely. So images are, are, are really important. Um, one thing we've tested out with the site I'm working on now with Friendly is um, we've been doing a lot of stuff with the Facebook news feed. And we've found that the image you actually put in the feed makes a pretty big difference in um, how many clicks you get per feed post. So we've actually gone on to. Um, uh, what's that site where you can get people to like create a lot of artwork for you? 99 designs. Uh, 99, designs. 99 designs. And we just like basically had a bunch of people cr come up with designs, and we said we'll award the prize to whoever gets the most clicks. And that was like a pretty cool way to test out a bunch of different images without us having to draw that artwork internally. I guess one thing we were talking about today was also you know this is probably looking as you know, the people who don't convert as being zero cost. And I wonder, you know, some of the things that may have happened with Slide and Rock you is there may have been this kind of user burnout experience that happens because there's actually a negative cost to right. non-converting sort of users. And also, is there a time-based sort of, you know, uh, part to this calculus? Since this is really looking at kind of one single loop through it, but, right. you know, newsfeed images may be presented multiple times, you know, over mm. a large range of users. Right. Yeah, you have to be careful about the messaging you use in, in your viral invites. Because like Dave said, if, if you use a message that gets a ton of clicks, but maybe it's a message that only certain types of people will click on. Um, like one example is uh, something that's like in the adult industry, for example. You might get a lot of clicks, um, but that might not be what you ultimately want to turn your business into. So you've always got to kind of gut check 
what you're actually what message you're actually using and just because it happens to have the highest click through rate doesn't necessarily mean it's the right message to be using because you, you may actually be propagating three different waves at the same time right one mm -hmm. is the positively converting you know viral loop one's a negatively converting i'm never going to you know do that at all and one's maybe neutral where they might still be open to it in a second time right. and i i think there is kind of this non-obvious negative cost to certain types of viral marketing where you actually maybe you get you know 10 percent of users to convert but you piss off the other 80 to 90 percent uh so bad and i often kind of use the example of you know if you ask every woman to go out with you on a first date it might improve your chances of getting that first date but it might not improve your chances of getting married um so you may be <laughs> trying to think about like what the tactical goal versus the long-term goal is you know, and depending on sort of that initial messaging, you may achieve a tactical goal, but not necessarily the long-term hey, goal. Dave, you, you talk, um, in the Valley there sort of has been uh, an idea that it, when you start up a company, you just need engineers, and basically anybody other than engineers is sort of superfluous. But today, how important Google, Google is probably there? has that philosophy, at least has to have that <laughs> philosophy. Facebook maybe to a lesser extent. Uh, how about um, today though, when you see, I mean, you're an angel investor, you're with the Founders Fund, you're doing your own yeah. stuff. How important is it for you to see someone who's a real expert in marketing right. in the company, or is that a skill that you can just sort of outsource? It's a great softball question. You obviously read my blog this weekend. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, so I, I think, you know, if you're building really highly technical products, you know, uh, PCs, operating systems, motherboards, search engine, browsers, you know, obviously technical skill is still quite important. Um, on the other hand, I think for consumer internet products, a lot of the technology is not terribly complicated. It's mostly data collection and presentation, and there may be scalability concerns and other things. And having great engineering talent is always, you know, usually a positive. Um, but I would say that, um, at least in my experience, critical skill factors in consumer internet product success are really more around addictive user experience, aka design, and what I would call scalable distribution, and whether that's a, a pure marketing function or a product-driven marketing function or an engineering-driven marketing function, it's really about how do you get users, right? And so I really think that we under-emphasize those two skill sets um, a lot. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, I'm really starting to focus more and more of my energy around you know companies where I feel like either <laughs> those elements are already on the team or they recognize that those are big parts of you know success and they're specifically trying to get great talent in the door um, because I think really you know not to you know deprecate talent in the engineering side but you need competent engineering talent um, and then you need great user experience and and very scalable marketing whether or not that comes from the marketing function um, so I would say those are two areas that are absolutely critical for a product for at least consumer internet product success. Can you think of some examples of companies nowadays that epitomize that? Um, you know, I wouldn't say it was always exactly that, but I think um, you know, YouTube at least had a pretty reasonably good visual design, mm -hmm. uh, Flickr in the earlier days. Um, mm -hmm. I would say at least some parts of Facebook, you know, whether or not it's beautiful site or not, it's relatively clean. Um, you know, those, are, those are ones that immediately yeah. come to mind. You mentioned Mint before, having some interest. Yeah, in. actually, so, you know, I, not to pimp my own stuff, but uh, <laughs> that was a company I did a little part-time work for and was an investor in, and early employee there, Jason Putardi, was a really talented designer. Uh, and one of the other guys who worked on the marketing there, both Noah Kagan in the early days and yep. then uh, Stu Langell more, more recently, uh, were great people, not for multiple different, you know, techniques in, in customer acquisition, SEO, SEM, content blogging strategies, and even email marketing strategies. Uh, Jason, in particular, uh, was recently hired by Bessemer uh, as kind of a designer in residence, which I believe is a new title. I don't know that anybody else <laughs> has ever had that before. Uh, and he's just a really talented individual who has both scripting and some engineering skills as well as design skills. Um, yeah. So. Uh, Ed, you have had a number of startups uh, that do viral um, viral marketing, and you've had some that covered email, some yeah. that cover mobile, SMS, mm -hmm. then Facebook, and you've experimented with Twitter and other platforms. Yeah. Can you talk uh, a little bit about the pros and cons of uh, developing for open platforms like email right. and platforms that are a little more proprietary like a Facebook or a Twitter? Sure. Um, 
So let's see. I, I've tested out a bunch of different platforms. The fact that I happen to be working on Facebook now is an indication that that's the one I'm most excited about at the current time. Um, I actually, I ended up getting burned by the mobile carriers, not with DateSite, but um, actually the, the thing I was doing right before Friendly was SMS based and it, we did get it viral, um, but then two weeks later we got shut down by AT&T. So it, it, it actually is fairly risky with this, this viral stuff is really powerful and when it works it's like it explodes and um, one thing with things that explode is when you have that many users who are signing up in such a short period of time just because there's so many users there's there's kind of a spectrum of users that love it and users that hate it so um, one thing you have to be careful about is you're going to always have some users that hate it and if your site's growing exponentially, the numbers of users that hate it is also growing exponentially. And so what happened with us was we started getting a lot of complaints to AT&T. Um, and AT&T took these complaints pretty seriously. And even though it was a few customer complaints, they just said, we're not going to mess around with this. We're just cutting you off. So suddenly we could no longer deliver text messages. Um, and you have a similar issue in email deliverability if yeah. you're successful in a viral loop on email uh, but you're also like sort of getting other people to sort of market as spam and you could right. basically enter a situation where your deliverability goes you know through the floor. Right. So even email it's not purely open. You have to still deal with um, Hotmail, Gmail, Yahoo. But it's, it's a lot easier to deal with them than to deal with uh, the carriers I found. And then Facebook. Um, I mean, well, you work at Facebook, so you know this better than I do, but... it's awesome. They are so great. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, awesome. I wasn't going to say that. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was going to say it's sometimes difficult to work with the, the fact that the platform is const constantly changing. Um, and, you know, as I said, we did one viral thing that was notification-driven. We got shut down a few times. Our notifications were shut down because we were growing really quickly and lots of people were getting notifications. Um, and Facebook's getting rid of notifications entirely for third-party developers in 30 days. So um, just a post today about you know enabling email access to users. Right, or, right. So they're now going to start allowing applications to ask for users' email addresses so that they won't have to go through the notification channel. So that's a, a good segue. You talked about Slide and Rocky, who are obviously and the send hotnesses of the world who are experts in this viral loop, and now you see. Uh, you know, the, sort of a new wave of companies like Zynga or, or Playfish, mm -hmm. who really are combining the viral loop stuff with the paid acquisition. Can you talk a little bit about how you've seen that shift in the Valley, Dave? I mean, I don't know that that's necessarily a new thing. I think, you know, maybe in the Facebook universe, that's something that Zynga is now perfected, mm -hmm. but, you know, affiliate marketing and performance marketing is something that's been kind of around for a long time and at least popular in the search universe mm -hmm. probably over the last four or five years. Um, so I, I think what's maybe interesting is to think about using, you know, game dynamics, game mechanics, you know, social distribution and paid acquisition as kind of lots of different ways to kind of, you know, tweak the levers. Um, and I think Ed had talked about this before, sometimes paid acquisition works even better, you know, than organic <laughs> acquisition because the users may know, you know, exactly what they're looking for and be very targeted, um, you know, in some of the areas. Right. But I, I think having that combination can actually work quite well, as Zynga has proven, and, and others as well. Um, like Dave was saying, there are certain businesses where it's very clear that you're not that sensitive around customer acquisition costs because you know that you'll be able to generate enough revenue per user that you're willing to pay $60 for that user. Um, then there are other businesses where you just have to do purely viral stuff because you can't even afford to pay like one cent for a user. And it's like a, pure, like a purely ad-driven business, for example, might be something like that, like some of these spammy Facebook apps. They can only make money because they literally don't have to pay a dime to acquire millions of users. Um, but what I think a lot of the social gaming companies on the Facebook platform has, have found is there's kind of a middle ground where they're actually able to generate some you know, attractive revenue numbers per user. So their ARPUs are pretty good, but still not high enough that they can afford to purely acquire users um, with paid acquisition. So by combining the two, they get their effective acquisition cost 
um, to be low enough that they can actually be quite profitable. And I think the companies that are able to um, basically out, out compete everyone else are the ones that, um, or, or the companies that are able to do better than all the others are the ones that can minimize their customer acquisition cost and still keep their ARPUs at the same levels. That's great. So, Fifteen minutes, including class questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. What well, was uh, when you guys think of putting on your marketing, your design hat? What are some of the most memorable mistakes that you've made, uh, and what have you learned from it? <laughs> well, I mean, other than your adult film. <laughs> <laughs> right. I didn't actually make that mistake. That was a <laughs> hypothetical. <laughs> At least not. A, I'm not willing to admit that I did. <laughs> On camera, especially. Either confirmed or denied the existence <laughs> of our nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, I mean, I guess the classic mistake in a lot of stuff is long cycle time on development. So, you know, particularly with a lot of the viral and quantitative stuff, you want to really have tight cycle time and measurement that's quick. Um, on, on the other hand, I do think that, you know, sometimes an overemphasis on quantitative methods, sometimes you can miss the whole point of kind of the call to action and what the actual problem solution space is you're going after. So, you know, I, I'm not really a big fan of sort of tactical approach to everything being viral, like upload your address book or whatever. Um, you know, there, there has been a rash of people employing those techniques, you know, no names per se, but, uh, um, and I think you really kind of miss out on the potential for a longer cycle time of user engagement. So if you think about, okay, if I'm just optimizing for the initial loop and the session behavior that I'm going after, maybe maximizing invitation rate, you know, and fan out to a large number of users, appears to be the most successful way to go after that, but that if you have a deeper level of engagement and a higher retention rate, maybe what you're actually seeing is that I've got five chances to get this user, and that possibly by dropping the imitation rate from 100 to 10, I get a deeper level of participation from the user, a higher level of engagement from the actual recipients of those invitations, and then over a longer period of time, you know, if the, rece the you know, imitation confirm rate is maybe better than 2x over the long time period of time, then maybe, you know, five rep repetitions of an invitation rate that's 2x better actually achieves a better outcome than that first, like, slam 100 invitations out the door for that first session behavior. Mm. Now, I don't know that I can necessarily prove that. That's more Ed's sort of like, let's go to the lab and see. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that that combined with the risk of not just only getting, you know, 10 out of those 100 invitations to work, but possibly 50 to 80 of those invitations to be negatively incented in the future. Like, I, I do think there's a lot more potential for exploring, you know, a, a soft onboarding of virality that's based on high engagement, um, so that you kind of get more powerfully evangelistic users um, who warm up to you over time. Um, and, you know, that's just more personal intuition that I can back mm -hmm. up right now, but I do think that I'm a much more believer in finding a product that people love and then figuring out viral techniques on top of that than going the other way around. So uh, one mistake that comes to mind is one I know you actually know about, which was this one feature we built on, on our site, Friendly, a few months ago, uh, which allowed you to create a photo album of all of your friends based on their zodiac signs. And uh, it was called Zodiac Photo Albums. I don't know. Some of you may have even seen it. Did anybody see that? Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I hope most of you don't remember that you saw it or don't associate it with uh, Friendly. But that, that feature was actually only live for less than 48 hours. Um, and it was, it was the most viral thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Within those 48 hours, I believe tens of millions of people on Facebook were tagged in photos. So it got out of control even more than I expected it to. And why uh, is that a bad thing? So, well, that's the thing. So at the Part time, <laughs> at the time when, we, when we launched it, I was like, wow, this is crazy. This is really like going out of control. And a, a lot of people really liked it too. Um, and we've also been very careful about always like keeping up with Facebook's policies and making sure we never violate any of them. And in this particular case, we actually weren't technically violating any of Facebook's policies either. So we were surprised we weren't because we were like, wait, this doesn't make sense that this thing can like 
grow this quickly yet still uh, abide by all of Facebook's policies. We still got shut down less than 48 hours after we launched it. Um, and what we learned from that was... On, on what basis? So, uh, we violated the spirit of the Facebook platform. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know. You work at Facebook. Maybe you can explain. No, but <laughs> the the thing is, I actually I was. Facebook's not all about like viral spamming or anything, right? Well, so, <laughs> so <laughs> Wait a which we had no this question. question. <laughs> 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 um, I, I have to say though that, like, even if we hadn't been shut down, I would have turned the feature off, um, and that is because it was getting out of control to a point where. Um, you know, there, there used to be that highlight section in the news feed, on the side of the news feed where it would show all these photos that your friends had been highlighted in. And because we were creating these photo albums that all of your friends were tagged in, all of these Zodiac photos like were automatically going into the highlight section. So we had a lot of people complaining like, Zodiac has taken over my Facebook news feed and uh, people that weren't happy with that. So it kind of, it got out of control. Um, we still have, so we, we turned it off, um, fortunately we recovered from that, but we still have users every single day emailing us asking for that feature back. Oh, interesting. <laughs> every single day. So um, that, was, that was something where if I had, what I should have done was um, probably take, cut things back a little bit and not let it grow as quickly as it did and maybe um, been a little more careful about kind of the, the user flows and it was it was probably a bit more aggressive than it needed to be. I, I think you know one other maybe example from a few years back. I was working at Simply Hired. We did mm -hmm. this exercise called Simply Fired, which was a bit of a sort of <laughs> uh, the founders had you know acquired the Simply Fired domain when they started the job site. Simply Hired was a is a job search engine uh, you know site that's helping people find uh, different jobs by using search engine approach. Um, Simply Fired was more of a, you know, fun entertainment site uh, that we created kind of around this concept of people who had been tragically or comedically fired from their jobs and uh, <laughs> initially we'd created sort of a send in your worst, you know, most tragic or funny story about getting fired and uh, we thought it would be an interesting way to raise some buzz and we got, you know, about 2,000 submissions, about 1,000 of which we posted and like, you know, really massive adoption. We had Site traffic went up by 300% that week. We got like publication in 10 national, you know, prints and online stuff. Um, you know, so at least from a buzz standpoint, you know, we achieved this, you know, great goal of getting a whole bunch of people talking about us. Um, but I, I don't think that we actually got target behavior that converted to the main purpose of the site, which was getting job seekers to come and find out about jobs. And so. I think sometimes you can succeed with a viral campaign in ways that don't actually uh, impact the target, you know, solution for your business, you know, and, you know, in some ways, Facebook, you know, the whole viral thing is about customer acquisition. It's not always about the actual underlying product in many ways, but I think for most other businesses where, you know, trying to convert to this other eventual revenue opportunity or at least, you know, deeper user engagement, you can do some funny or silly or interesting things on the viral side that, aren't really converting to that behavior. So, you know, beware of the tactical win, but again, <laughs> you know, sort of not achieving the long-term goal. Interesting. Right. Yeah, so Dave, you're, you're an investor, so you, have, you do angel investing, you also do Founders yeah. Fund, and yep. uh, there's blogs writing about you having a VC fund. Is that public? No comment. Talk about? No comment. <laughs> so, as you're, uh, so that was a hardball question. That wasn't really a question, that was a preamble. <laughs> but uh, the, when, you're, when you're counseling or talking to startups or consulting with them, and they talk about building on a platform and sort of betting their company on a platform, uh, and then obviously Facebook and Twitter are two of the most common platforms now. Uh, Google obviously has some platform elements too, as do other uh, sites. What, what do you counsel them? Where do you think the uh, smart money is going? Um, you know, I, I think there's probably a, a lots of different ways to get customer acquisition, but ones that are pretty popular, top of mind for me at least, are probably Facebook, Twitter, Google for natural search, Apple for iPhone, and probably Android coming in the near future, um, and then email. I mean, I think those are sort of five or six basic things. They're not all equivalent to the same you know, kind of platform approach, but they're all sort of large market opportunities that probably have 100 million user opportunities or better, and there's at least some predictability in behavior, maybe some less so than others. 
Um, I think the other thing to consider in those categories is not just access to users, but access to monetization. So, you know, currently Facebook is a great platform for access to users, as is Twitter. They're both maybe questionable in terms of monetization. Apple, iPhone might be the flip side of that, mm -hmm. which is not always predictable on the user side, but the monetization's pretty good. Um, and then, you know, depending on what you have for sale on search, um, you know, SEO and SEM work pretty well, and there's a lot of users on search. Uh, so I, I do think that it's useful to think of platforms more in terms of distribution and monetization than they are features. Um, you know, obviously there's some functional use that each of those platforms brings to you in terms of different um, available feature sets, but the more interesting things that I like to think about from an investor standpoint is what's the audience of users and what's the potential for monetization. Gotcha. That's great. So why don't we open it up to uh, questions from the class? For that, for that kind of growth, what are you using on the back end to scale that fast? Because that's incredible to be able to handle that kind of yeah. back end. Fortunately, I met a very talented engineer while I was at Stanford, and that's one thing I would recommend any of you who are starting up companies. Um, I know we were talking about how engineering may be overrated these days, but I'd say you've got to make sure you have at least one really good engineer who knows what he's doing, he or she is doing. Um, so he's been awesome. I mean, our technology is based on the LAMP stack, MySQL, uh, like PHP. No, we're, we are not doing cloud computing. We just um, have a bunch of servers <coughs> hosted in the Midwest somewhere. Very so, nice. yeah. What do you guys think about Google Web Application Toolkit? Do you think it's, I mean, there's so much there, and there's Wave and all these things built on it. Um, versus like PHP and, and more traditional So I've, I've never used it, so I, I don't know if I can really comment on it. I don't know if you have any thoughts. You know, I, I don't really have a strong opinion on any individual technology stack other than that, you know, as long as there's lots of people available who know how to use it, um, yeah. I wouldn't want to be betting on a technology stack that doesn't <coughs> have at least, you know, broad market acceptance by a good group of users. So obviously stuff that Google's putting out is going to have some level of adoption. Um, you know, maybe more on the back end, looking at App Engine versus you know Amazon Web Services and other things. I might have some concerns about that, but I, I tend to be technology agnostic for the most part, uh, and more interested in what the actual talents of the engineers are. You don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask. Uh, I'm just going to jump in here. Uh, <laughs> I mean, taking taking this framework and trying to apply it. Let's say I'm I'm a student in the class and I have a project where I'm trying to actually use social media for social good. I don't have access to a lot of engineers. I don't have access to a lot of money. How would you take this framework and, and apply it to actually trying to solve that goal? Uh, that's a that's a tough one. So you don't have to. Ha well, so I should say you don't have to have a superstar engineer to build your first version of something like this. I mean, probably any of you in this room could could learn how to build a simple Facebook application. And so I'm a big believer in building a minimal, minimal viable product. So basically build something as simple as possible and get it out there and start collecting data. Get a, get a few people to start using it and don't, don't spend I think one of the things that a lot of MBAs, myself included, have um, done in the past that I, I view as a big mistake is spending way too much time planning something before you get something out the door and actually start to get users uh, using it. So I'd say just try to build something very simple. Just come up with like the simplest thing you can put out there. and. Um, Facebook apps are actually not that, that hard to build. So if you get something that starts to take off, then it's going to be a lot easier to find the engineers who are going to be excited to work on that and help you scale it. Yeah, I think you can test a lot of things out using landing page tests so, and mm -hmm. search engine marketing. So you know, on a relatively you know, small budget, you can acquire at least hundreds of users and probably even single digit thousands of users and run a fair number of tests on basic landing page copy and graphics. And so, you know, it's not that complicated before you even actually start coding to just, you know, build a couple of combinations of, of copy and image, um, set up, you know, some mm -hmm. search engine marketing tests on Google AdWords and start gauging customer reaction based on a click through and then maybe some, you know, subsequent uh, landing pages. I want to do two more questions and then do something. 
are there any um, marketing resources or companies that you feel are doing a really great job of helping companies with this today? Um, and if so, who are they? And if not, why not? Guess metrics. <laughs> want to plug them? <laughs> yeah, I guess I, Again, being a company I'm an investor in. Uh, it's a company called Kissmetrics. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an advisor, so. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Jeff's also an investor. Um, so they have a couple different products, but uh, survey.io is a very um, simple survey question focused way to um, do more qualitative assessment from a small number of users, say less than 100, uh, about what things they like or don't like that can help you kind of get to the heart of what the you know, high value part of your product or feature set is. Uh, usually that questioning kind of goes around, what would you hate most if I took it away? Um, uh, and then they have other products that are also more on traditional dashboard type uh, ways to measure, I guess, more people and workflow than pages. So typical Google Analytics stuff has been really more around pages uh, and clicks, less about people and workflows. Although now with uh, goals and conversions in Google Analytics, you can also do that. Uh, in terms of companies, it kind of depends on whether you're talking about, you know, social media marketing and conversation stuff or more tactical kind of, you know, viral loop things. I, you know, I think Ed does some consulting on the side for ridiculous prices or <laughs> not, 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 not really any, <laughs> not much anymore, but <laughs> I um, used to. <laughs> uh, Is it, would it be, could you give an example of the kind of uh, questions you're facing? Maybe that would help. Mm. So kind of encompassing yeah. I mean, I guess I was more, so I, not that I have a ton of different examples around that, but that survey.io process or other uh, ways is kind of more qualitative assessment of what users uh, are going after, um, looking at the actual workflow and sort of measuring kind of conversion through the various steps is something that's done in a tool they call a product planner, but now I think that's more in dashboards. And there's um, some great blogs out there, in addition to Dave's. Um, Andrew Chen has a really good yeah. blog on this kind of viral marketing stuff. Yeah. Um, Sean Ellis as well. Eric Reese. Eric Reese. Yeah, those would be three Steve, of my top. Steve Blank. Eric Reese. His Thomas. blog, Startup Lessons Startup Learned. The example, if you, the easy thing is if you go to any of those three, they'll reference each other enough. That yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have a cabal. Of <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, using Facebook Connect, is it possible to do newsfeed optimization? Newsfeed optimization? Yeah, as we were saying before, of the pictures that you put the yeah. thumbnails and all yeah. that. Can you really influence how high in the newsfeed of someone's friend your site can come up and stuff like that? I think that Facebook, Facebook doesn't provide. You want to answer that? <laughs> so yeah, we. So I, I'd I, like I, to. I'd like things. to hear Matt's answer to so this. Actually, uh, this isn't like the official answer, but I do want to. So uh, <laughs> that's even better. The short answer is actually no, but it's not really. A, <laughs> <laughs> wow, I've never heard anybody say that. <laughs> the, so so right now, I mean, the news feed is basically an algorithm that basically takes the universe of things that are going on to Facebook and tries to deliver you the top X results uh, sorted by what you find most interesting. That depends partially on who's taking the action. So if there's some person who you're really interested in and they do almost anything that will be interesting to you, if there's some action that's very interesting, like someone got engaged or, or married or something, that's pretty interesting no matter who it is in your network. So that, that's once again more likely to rise to the top. Um, but I think the deeper question there is regardless of what that algorithm is, you know, regardless of what, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, of how it's going to be ranked, how do you, you know, uh, bring some of this sort of rigor to designing newsfeed stories. For that, you need to get a lot of data back, which actually right now mm -hmm. we don't provide. Um, and it's not really a conscious thing, it's more like a prioritization thing. So I think we hope to in the future be able to provide more of that. Uh, but right now, if you want to know how many people hide your stories, how many people click on individual links, you know, where the placement is in the newsfeed that delivers that, those things you can't really do right now. I think most, most people are addressing it by doing more tactical measurement of click-throughs and sort of trying to guess at what the level of impressions and frequency. Um, it's mostly done through sequential testing, I think, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. You know, throw one image up, see how many clicks come through, throw another image up, but you're not necessarily 
able to deal with independent variables. Um, and also in the click-throughs, though, you can measure, right? With yeah, but I'm just saying measures. if there's other extraneous factors going on. So yep. usually you want to be able to sort of measure around similar periods of time of day or week right. or something. Yep. So there are other actions that might go on that are out of control. Or if people actually even see the newsfeed story. That's like an important one, right? So that's right. another one you don't have yeah. access to, unfortunately. But so it's a bit of a black box. And yeah, you can kind of get some basic idea of whether or not it's working if, you're, if you measure how many clicks you're getting per post on average. Um, that's a number we look at. But uh, it's, it's still a bit of a black box. I'm curious about mince growth. And if you have a strong perspective on whether it was retention or referral or traffic that was a bigger contributor to mince yeah, I mean, the product by itself was very uh, frequent use because you know, people have I'm interested in probably checking out, at least on a weekly or monthly basis, the summary of transactions that they did. So the user experience was great, but the call to action to enter you know, financial passwords is a pretty high bar. So the assumption was that we would have a low conversion rate, and we had to sort of have a very high trust level on the experience, a very visually compelling one, and that we had to have retention through, um, you know, for the people who are in the product coming back on a regular basis, so regular emails. Um, there was also a strategy around, you know, content-based uh, acquisition. So we came up with a strategy of doing frequent posting on blogs around personal finance uh, and having an in-house content generation as well as working with partners. Um, actually, Aki Sano, who's in the back row, is uh, probably an interesting person to chat with. He's the founder of a company called Cookpad in Japan that uh, went public on the, the Japanese market earlier this summer. Um, and I, I think what's interesting about sites like that and about Facebook is their frequent use products. So in his case, it's recipe sites and the users are people who are, you know, making food and that's a pretty frequent occurrence <laughs> for Facebook. It's a site where a lot of people log in on a daily or weekly basis and there's a lot of advantages that you can get from frequent use products. Um, so, uh, or for products that aren't frequent use, if you can think about ways to manufacture frequency of top of mind, either through a periodic you know, email or other user-driven events or system-driven events that kind of get users to come back. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't have a compelling, you know, a not compelling product use case. So, you know, retention isn't going to work if your product sucks or isn't, like, useful. Um, but I do think a lot of people don't pay attention enough to, if you're able to get an email and you have permission from users, how do you make the most out of that? And how do you kind of uh, provide regular periods of interaction with those users? So, for me, even though virality is sort of like, you know, hot and sexy, I think a lot of the, the stuff that I like to get people to focus on initially is about initial product activation, which is kind of this landing page exercise and what uh, images and copy are compelling uh, and tied into the business. Um, how do you get um, retention from frequent use? So if you solve the activation and retention problems, then I think it's a much better base to move on to different user acquisition strategies, whether they're you know paid or organic or viral or other, because you don't have the leaky bucket syndrome. And I think if you're not really you know optimizing that you know initial activation experience or retention experience, whatever other strategies you're going to go after are going to be more expensive or not successful as much. Did you layer virality then onto that? I don't, I don't think about? Mint is a particularly viral product. I mean, and again, mm -hmm. it's not it's not really necessary because the users are worth more per user, probably at least ten dollars and maybe more. Um, so that's again why you know a lot of people don't like search engine marketing driven strategies, but actually if the users are value enough, it's fine, right? <laughs> Dave, um, do you want to talk a bit about Mint's use of PR pretty effectively? Yes, yeah, so, I mean there was a lot of buzz and PR strategy from Mint, and you know that. Uh, and another company that's probably in that same category might be Dogster or uh, Catster. I mean, if there's a human interest story that you can tell over and over and over again, you know, people are never bummed out about talking about money in many cases. So there's, there's a pretty compelling story around money, particularly your money, that's always going to be relevant. Um, you know, cats and dogs and children and families are also stories that are always, you know, evergreen. Um, food and sex and uh, power and those types of things are, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a great book called uh, The Mating Mind, uh, I'm forgetting the author right now, but um, talks a lot about um, Charles Darwin's theory of sexual selection, which most people are not aware of, at least aware of like natural selection, but there's a, a ton of, you know, human decision making, which is 
um, tied into you know genetic <laughs> strategies for how we optimize for mate selection, and a lot of those also influence sort of visual experience. Um, and so understanding a lot of the human psychology dynamics of why you know people are attracted to power, sex, money, you know, are things that are probably quite useful in how you come up with design for at least consumer product experiences that I, I think are really important. So Julio said we have more time, so I'm just going to keep going until he one, tells one us more. to stop. But now one more. And by the way, another book that I think is great and also evergreen is uh, uh, Influence, Psychology, Persuasion, uh, Robert Shelby. Yeah, that's yes, great. that's an awesome book. Yeah, so um, I think stores, you know, pretty notorious for its distribution. It's pretty hard for iPhone app to actually, you know, unless they get into the top 100, you know, chart. Right. Um, I was wondering if the uh, virality is different on the mobile platform and if there are any, you know, successful examples. Yeah. It's not different. It's non-existent. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, actually, I think maybe Jeff can talk about that a little bit later because I know he does a lot of investment on iPhone apps. But um, at least right now, I mean, I, I guess I would say that you know, two sort of things that are not obvious maybe is I don't think that really YouTube is incredibly social or viral. Like, I mean, there are certain aspects of it which you know create distribution. But like, I always think yeah. about like if they had you know more Facebook Connect or some other sort of social network embedded in there, like I think the growth would just be like amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Your um, use of YouTube in itself is not social. No, it's very addictive, but it's not necessarily, I mean, it's socially spread through other mediums like, you know, yep. email and Twitter and everything else, but there's not really an innate social network that they're using on YouTube. Um, iPhone also, there's not a social dynamic really built into mm -hmm. iPhone right. at all. And in fact, I, th I think we're most likely to see iPhone apps getting viral on Facebook before we see them getting viral on iPhone's own, Apple's own platform. And I don't, so. I don't think they really designed the mechanic in such a way that, you know, sort of link backs to the iPhone store have a, a smooth experience, right? There's a fair amount of friction in the installation process that aren't really great for sort of getting that viral factor above one. Right. Um, and, you know, most of the other apps, I mean, I guess Faint is one of the sort of systems that's not an Apple product, but mm -hmm. it's also trying to implement social dynamic. There's um, also the Connect SDK for iPhone. And Facebook Connect, although yeah. plug. I, you know, <laughs> as much as I think that was promising, I don't think you've really seen that take off in ways that yeah. developers are emphasizing. Yeah. So, you know, you know, story TBD, watch this space. I, yeah. I think there's a ton of potential for, you know, Apple to do a deal with Facebook or Apple to do a deal with, you know, maybe other people. But uh, right now, social distribution on the iPhone isn't a major component of thinking, I think, for a lot of developers, yeah. although you'd guess that it could be or should be. If Apple let you look through, as a, as a third-party developer, look through someone's address book and tell you phones. which of those users had iPhones, yeah. which data they and AT&T actually have, but mm -hmm. they won't actually tell you, then it could be viral. Because when you're on Facebook, you know all of your friends on Facebook are on Facebook. Right. When you're on your iPhone, you don't know which of your friends are on iPhone, so you can't be like, oh, check out this iPhone app because you don't even know which ones to share it with. And, and I think there's like a ton of value in stuff like that that's really not been explored because um, if you think about like sort of what Facebook knows about, you know, user interaction and wall and what, you know, inbox providers know about email um, frequency and what phone uh, carriers know about sort of like what are the top most numbers that you dial and everything. So like there's an interesting set of things to think about, like when you send an email, how fast does someone respond to it? Mm -hmm. Like what's the number of people that you have frequent email communication with? Um, what are the topics and keywords that are sort of most likely to get you to open or click an email? Like I think there's an incredible amount of information in the inbox about who your, you know, who your friends are or at least who the top, you know, 20 to 50 people are that you interact with frequently. And so, like, you know, your boss, your family, your spouse, your partner, like, those types of power uh, relationships and understanding, like, who do you respond to quickest and who do you not respond to quickest? Like, there's sort of these three groups of, I have fanatic following about this person and I pay attention to all their actions. I have non-fanatic, you know, interaction with this group or they have that interaction with me and then there's peer group, right? And so understanding those dynamics into those three categories, like, who do I follow? who follows me and then who's kind of buying uh, the peer relationships. 
there's there's all that information is embedded in those products. Mm -hmm. Like, and they could be exposed. Not all of the people are exposing it. Facebook's obviously using it for newsfeed optimization and algorithmic stuff. Um, so as you sort of think about how you're developing products, I think trying to understand like what data is available. Like, can you you know scrape the page and see what's the number of actual friends or posts that are going on? Like, are, is this person more extroverted than others? You know, maybe those are good targets for viral sort of. Uh, you know, calls to action. People who are less virally focused, you know, maybe those are people that you target for user engagement and retention actions. Awesome. Sorry, I'm going off. I think we're done. <laughs> but uh, thanks, guys. That was super fun. Thank you. And, uh,